This is the first episode of The Lionhead Diary. My name is Peter Molyneux. Let me just explain a little bit about what you'll be seeing. We at the Game Developers Conference recently unveiled one of the three big features that are going to feature in Fable 2. And that big feature is the emotions that you will be feeling as you play the game. And so, you feeling loved is really important to us. And that's what a lot of this episode is about. Love is that warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you realize that somebody cares about you so much they'll forgive you being a complete ass. Love is very important to me, uh, sort of in my life. I kind of very much uh, like to consider myself a romantic. Love means many things to me. It's family love, uh, erotic love. What people often do is, conf is confuse lust with love. Love for pizza, love for coffee. God, I love coffee. Because we deal with love every day in our, in our lives, and we kind of, it's something we recognize and are very you know, sort of intimate with, if it's faked on screen, it can be very jarring. It can be very you know, obvious that it's wrong. And so it's very difficult to get that right. As we get more processing power, the AI will indeed get more uh, sophisticated and you'll be able to track a lot more variables, you'll be able to do a lot more with it. And so all of the ambitions that we had for Fable 1, which we couldn't quite put in, we are bringing back into Fable 2. Most RPGs are about going off on grand adventures, uh, and you know, Fable's exactly the same respect in that respect. There's all the very, very big sort of supernatural, uh, 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 exciting, action-orientated uh, storyline. Uh, but what we try to do with Fable games is we try to, to make sure that the player realizes that all the things he does out in the world while he's out adventuring have a really, really big impact on the rest of the world and how the rest of the world sees them. Uh, so for us, uh, the love and the, the respect and the fear, all these factors here are altered each time you go away on one of these little missions. And for us, that makes it a much, much deeper experience than simply going out, bashing a dragon on the head and going, right, I've got 30 something rather points. We'd like to bring the emotion back into it at all times. I think love's going to be a very important part of that. In Fable 1, we had the, you do the sexy expressions and stuff, and they like you more. You give them gifts, they like you a bit more. And we kind of try to build on that. So there's that aspect of it in Fable 2, but there's a lot more to it as well to try and get someone to fall in love with you. And hopefully we'll get the balance right such that if you feel, find one person, the way they talk to you, it slowly builds, and you can tell you're kind of, you're getting there slowly, and you know, I think they'll sort of maybe want you to take them out as well, rather than just giving them gifts. They might want to go for a nice walk with you. That sort of thing is a, is a thing that we're experimenting with to try and get the process of them falling in love with you to be more, um, I guess, more real. What I said at GDC was um, I was talking about emotions again, and I was focusing on love, and I was definitely focusing on being loved. And I focused on the dog because I wanted to show the quality that we were putting into the dog in the game. Gamers, casual gamers, everybody who sees that dog, they will say, that's a dog. I understand him. I understand when he's excited. I understand when he's sad. I understand when he's, uh, when he's happy. I understand when he's hurt. He looks like a real dog. You know, what we could have done is given you this dog and made him controllable by you. Uh, allow you to send him to places, get him to wait, um, have, have him so that you could press a button he could attack. That would have been the easy thing to do, but no, we've been brave about this. We give you no control over the dog. I don't press a button when I go out with my dog for a walk. I just go out with the dog, and the dog does his thing. And he knows that if I don't like something, he damn well doesn't do it. That's how you control the dog in the game. If you look at the history of other visual media, uh, cinema, for example, the addition of love uh, and sort of emotive content has been a really big deal. If you look at Charlie Chaplin, he introduced emotion into a film called The Kid, and suddenly cinema was elevated to a new form of art. Uh, I'm not quite saying we're there yet, but I'd very much like to think that we're kind of in the vanguard of, of groups who are interested in this side of games rather than you know, sheer thumb candy. We give you no control over the dog. Just think about that a second. No control over the dog. You haven't got a dog button. And a lot of people would say, that's just mad, man. You know, it, 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 how can I be engaged with something? And what we've said is, you control the dog by playing the game. You control the dog by worrying about you as a hero. I think the very fact you don't control him makes him feel real, makes him feel like something that has a mind and that has an agenda, and that agenda, first and foremost in that agenda, is his love for you. 
his willingness to sacrifice himself for you, his need to please uh, you in everything that he does. Product not yet rated. Welcome to the second episode of the Lionhead Video Diary. My name is Peter Molyneux. This episode is going to be all about combat. <laughs> I got into a fight at school and I got my jaw broken. That was pretty nasty. I came away with all sorts of broken limbs and cuts and gashes and bruises and God knows what. My worst fight is probably where well, I just got knocked out by a midget. Well, not necessarily a midget, but he was a very small, small guy. Whether we like it or not, there was a lot of combat in Fable 1 and we really wanted to specialise and make something different for Fable 2. So we've looked at a couple of things. One is something that's called one-button combat. Now, a lot of people have said, you can't put combat on one button. What I hope this video diary says to you is that you can. On Fable 1, we had loads of different ideas about how we wanted to move forward with the combat. Um, and we always would come up with a new thing and there'd always be the standard problem of, well, how do we work this into, into, the, into the controls? And it was just so limiting thinking, well, we've run out of buttons for that. How will the player actually make this happen? And by stripping back to just using one button, it's like, well, it seems the sky's the limit all of a sudden. Anything we can think of based on the context that it's appropriate, we can do just with a single button press. The key thing that we've been uh, dealing with with one-button combat is ensuring that it is approachable for, for all gamers. It, it is approachable for people who haven't played games before. Um, but it's also got uh, the depth that seasoned gamers want. That was a, one of the key things that we felt we could have done a little better with in Fable 1. There are fewer things a player can do with his hands. So you have to make sure that of all the enormous varieties of actions that the character can do in the game, you always get the one that, you, that is most appropriate for where you want to be. So you almost want the, the game to read the player's mind and do exactly what he intends to do at, at that specific time, which, as you can imagine, mind reading is quite a difficult thing to program. Our goal is not to, to make combat look realistic, it's to make it believable. We want, we want you to feel like you're, you're in the game hitting the enemies. I mean, it's not a realistic game. It's got creatures in it, it's got hobs, it's got gigantic trolls, you use magic. Um, we, want, we want the combat to all fit together in this, this world and we want the world to be believable. The character in the game, we like to think is smarter than any character in any game before this, as far as combat is concerned. He always knows where he is, he always knows what's, what's around him and he's going to use um, all items of the, the environment that he can to basically cause as much damage to his enemies as possible in the coolest way you can imagine. If you're close enough to the enemy and you press attack, you get to smack their head off a log, which is great. And then sets it up nicely for a finishing move. He's going to the loo. We did loads of research. We looked at videos, we looked at games, 
we uh, just happened to find people around the studio that had life-sized weapons at home. Uh, a little bit disturbing. Um, not, not completely real, but there were some life-size metal swords brought in, which it was really useful because we could go out into the car park and video ourselves doing specific moves for the hero. We also got a sword master in called Richard Ryan, who showed us how he would actually fight with a sword. Quite a scary guy. He had a guitar case full of weapons um, and didn't mind getting quite close to us when he was demonstrating swings and things. But that gave us a lot of ideas, a lot of new ideas. The most important factor in making combat believable is the reaction of the, the enemy. So when you hit the enemy, if they react in a way that's incredibly satisfying, it's just fantastic. We're looking at uh, perhaps unlocking certain elements of the combat further along down the storyline so that instead of having everything available from the start, your, your character becomes more skilled as the story progresses. The most exciting introduction to Fable is the flintlock pistol, which comes with a complete design and style of Fable 2, which is a highwayman. And, you know, without highwaymen, you have to have guns. I'm, I'm very confident, actually, that we're going to cover everything that, well, I I'll never say everything that a player will want to do because there's some pretty weird players out there from, our, from the mail we get. But, you know, I, I'd say 95% of what people will want to do, I think we're going we're gonna to get in there. Absolutely. When it comes to combat, nothing beats a good old game of English football. Lionhead Challenge fellow Microsoft Game Studio Rare had a recent match. The footy against Rare was fantastic. Uh, we really want to try and make it a regular thing, really. Just a, a regular drubbing that you can dish out for them. Yay! How's the match going, Wood? It's going pretty good. Are you winning? We are with 2-0 up front. Go on, And just for the record, who won? Lionhead or Rare? Lionhead, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, absolutely. Lionhead. I am a geek and a Greek. <laughs> I would say I'm a hidden geek. I am a complete geek. Well, I don't think so. I like to keep up with the latest trends on the high streets. I suppose I am a bit of a geek. I've had the traditional geek bringing up. I had a um, chemistry set at the age of seven. Tim Rance is a very big geek, yeah, but I mean, we can sort of make exceptions for some people. Attention to all sorts of very obscure technical details that bores everybody stupid. <laughs> CTG stands for Central Technology Group, and the purpose of the Central Technology Group is to create reusable technology that can be used by all of the game teams. If I asked you to build a house um, and presented you with a big pile of rocks and trees and concrete and so on, the first thing you'd probably ask me for would be the right tools. The specific advantages of CTG within the company for the games is that they can focus purely on the gameplay. They don't have to worry about writing tools again, writing technology again. The tools that we create are in use by the Fable team and they aren't tools that you can just buy off the shelf. A follow-up project or game will use the same code and tools that we've produced and they can go straight into making the game and producing cool games for everybody. Currently I'm uh, working on a spline tool, that means splines are basically curves, so I'm trying to make a tool to help people put things on curves. Lionhead has been making these tools and games for the past 10 years, and to celebrate our anniversary, a big fancy dress party was planned. I've taken two days off to build my costume, which is a pyramid head from Silent Hill. 
I spent so long deliberating whether I should go as the film version, which is a little bit more recognisable, or whether I should be really hardcore and go as the game version, and I kind of bottled out and went for the film version. Four hours in, and I, I don't seem to be getting anywhere really, but uh, I might need to go for a little sit down. One of the things that's a real struggle for game developers is, is fitting all of those assets into memory and onto the DVDs. What we've done is develop some compression routines that squashes down the data so that it will fit in the available memory. And we've done this with animations which take up huge amounts of memory uncompressed. Uh, we've done it with textures which are the sort of beautiful pictures that go onto the meshes that we create in an animation, which is basically the movement of a character around the world, we've managed to squeeze those down to just 1% of their original size. It just helps the pipeline, the content, from the people, the creative people, through to the actual game itself. I told everyone that um, I was taking some days off to do some charity work. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be good. It's going well. In Lionhead, as we are focused on creating uh, games which cost tens of millions of dollars, sometimes it's great to be able to have a small group of people who can actually spend some time that's not directly on the main game development and instead can research a bit of blue sky thinking. One example of that is we thought that it would be very interesting to look at new types of combat. We wanted to experiment with um, something that really brought the drama out of combat. Drama is important and vital for combat because it gives it a nice full-fledged purpose, a motivation for the player. The whole idea about it is to try and leverage everything that you can to make the combat more exciting without actually changing the combat itself. So we can use a lot of stuff from movies, such as camera work and music, and we can also use everything that we've got in games, like simulation and sound effects and the rumble on the joypad. Drama is the one thing which make, will make the difference between just a normal fighting or repetitive fighting mechanics and, uh, and turn it into an experience, a challenge. Apart from running out of paint uh, and, and finding out that this is coming off all over me and my clothes, um, well, I'm a little bit behind, but <laughs> I'll just work through the night again. There's a whole range of things that have gone into Fable 2 to help the production of Fable 2 and the game itself. The fog adds a certain sense of atmosphere. Pete thought it was a, a good idea to actually get a, a fog machine in. It was quite good fun actually. We, we put it in a bucket and all of a sudden our bucket was full of mist and we just spent an entire day playing with it. It was great. <laughs> we used it to get a good uh, sense of how mist moves around and and then uh, I believe uh, Peter Molyneux uh, nicked it for his pond at home and he, he still hasn't returned it. Strange things are afoot in Peter's garden and it's not just the mystery of the missing fog machine. Lionhead celebrated its 10th anniversary in style. Pyramid Head was in good company with numerous game celebrities in attendance.
Oh, Lord. What would I do if I was a woman for a day? I would go shopping for chocolate shoes. Um, I'd probably take that little uh, pink floral dress I've got in my wardrobe and wear that without fear of getting caught. <laughs> well, ignoring the, uh, the obvious spending all day in the shower uh, type answer. I think at the moment I would uh, help breastfeed my new baby little girl. Uh, four boobs are better than two. I think I'd probably get a map and get in the car and see if it really is that hard to find out where the hell you are. Well, I wouldn't be pregnant, that's for sure, because that's pretty horrendous. I think if I were a woman for a day, I would probably just enjoy the luxury of having some hair. A good piece of concept art should take a basic idea that you've been given and imbue it with all the atmosphere possible. My favourite concept art that I've done has been generally the villagers and the creatures in Fable 2, especially the villagers work that I've done. I hope I can see my influence in the style of the people in Fable, the style of the creatures. I hope that there's a little bit of darkness and a little bit of weirdness in there that's me. Fitting the world and the characters together is really best handled at the concept stage to make sure that everybody's on board with the, the general idea. The art in Fable 2 obviously has a large technical kind of component to it. The most important thing is not to let the technology stand in the way of our artists. We do have uh, a pipeline basically where uh, artists will create a character and then they will pass it on to our technical animator Emilio who will then rig the model which is basically giving the shell a skeleton inside so we can move it and uh, create our animations with it. At the moment I'm just doing some polishing to the male hero's uh, skin. So I'm rendering out um, from ZBrush uh, skin materials on a, on a high-res mesh. We have a dynamic time of day and when you start looking at the current generation of consoles and the type of complicated pre-computed lighting that we have to do to make the world feel you know, really kind of alive, um, to do that with a dynamic time of day is actually you know, quite a tricky uh, job. Um, so that's one of the things we do. Also, we allow you to walk from outside straight into a house, pretty much any house in the game coping with the lighting and with just the sheer amounts of you know memory it takes to store all of this stuff is really kind of complicated so there are a lot of key kind of technology choices that you know really bring the fable world to life I think there's a few things that we do that other games don't do. Uh, for a start, our morphing hero is definitely something that uh, other games uh, really don't do. There's a lot of emphasis in other games of customising your hero, but having a hero evolve dynamically as you play the game uh, is a real challenge for us. The morphs in Fable 2, are they going to be as extreme as we've hinted at? Yeah, 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 they really are. I mean, you know, we, we, we had this technology in Fable 1. We've got grand visions, as anybody who's ever listened to Peter will know. All of the classic morphs from Fable 1 are back, really. Uh, so we've got all the strengths, the, the fat ones, the thin ones. We've also got the good and evil ones there. But this time, there's kind of another added dimension to it. In Fable 2, we've kind of said, well, that's all very important and interesting and whatever else. But we kind of, we haven't really measured what you're like as a social individual. We haven't looked to see whether you're, I don't know, are you a gambler? We kind of looked at all the things that people were asking, sort of things like university purity tests. Have you ever kissed anybody? And we're kind of measuring those things throughout the game this time. And our hope is that we'll be able to bring those into the good and evil morphs and add a little bit more depth so you don't kind of get the same, I'm evil, I look this way. This time it'll be, I'm evil, I look this way. And you can also tell what I'm like with other people as well. We've still got tattoos. Uh, we've got makeup this time around. And obviously our, the bank of clothing and outfits is far larger than in Fable 1. So all that is customizable, interchangeable. So if you want to wear your chicken hat with your corset 
and your high boots, you can. You can make the hero look as cool as you want, or you can make them look, you know, a complete fool, the real clown around town. What we want to do this time is make sure that you feel the, the sort of the terror of impending death, but this time kind of take the sting out of the risk by saying, okay, we're not going to rewind the game for you. You will lose something, you will lose some experience, but we're not going to force you to play that bit of the game again because you're obviously having some difficulty with it. So what we're going to do instead is take the experience from the environment around you and use that for your kind of your one last heroic struggle. You'll rise up, kind of burst up with energy, and everybody will go flying. And da -da -da -da, the music will swell, and you'll feel very heroic for that moment. I am the audio director at Lionhead. I've been working in audio for about 15 years. I started working at Bullfrog with Peter, and uh, some of the games you might know are things like Syndicate, which is the first game I ever worked on, Theme Park, Magic Carpet, Dungeon Keeper, going through to Lionhead then, which was black and white, things like uh, the movies, and Fable, of course. Most of it was recorded with sketch samples, first of all, which we then converted into scores. And the scores were then given to an orchestrator, and the orchestrator then makes those orchestra friendly, and we went over to Bratislava and recorded it all with the Slovak National Symphony Orchestra at the National Radio Hall there, the concert hall. My goal with music has always been just to add colour to the game. Music should be there as something which is a backdrop to what you're looking at so that it makes you feel like you're part of that world. When you're in the castle you want to feel like you're in somewhere regal and grand so that's why we use the orchestra as like a chamber piece. My involvement with the ambient sound effects, with the team we have here, I designed a system whereby we could paint ambient layers onto the actual Fable maps, so that as you're running through a forest, for instance, we painted down a, a forest theme, and the blending from one ambience to another is quite important. So the technology was laid down, first of all. The ambient sound has progressed quite a long way. In Fable 1, we were able to place sounds down on a map, say here is a river, here is a set of trees, this sort of thing. But it was always sort of constrained by the amount of CPU power and memory. So we went back to the drawing board and we found ways of expanding the systems available to the sound designer, the tools, the processes. So we can now take things like, I don't know, say, say there's a tower over in the distance. We can actually factor that, that in. So if you want a distant hum that controls that, it's easy enough to actually place that in. The sound designer has that level of control, whereas in Fable 1, we couldn't have done that. Now, in terms of the actual sound design, I obviously have, have the, the directorial sort of influence as to what 
region should sound like. But on the whole, I've given the actual uh, placement of those sounds and the design of those sounds to SoundLab in the States, who are Microsoft's own sound department. I'm a boss guy Whitmore. I'm Christopher Melroth. Hello. Uh, director of audio for MGS. And I am uh, the sound design supervisor on this title. New title. We just made it up. Sound design supervisor. Interrupt by self, true. Interrupt by group, true. That's how we make sound effects. We just kind of... This entire game was done with mouth noises. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Guy did all of the uh, swords. King Song! <laughs> so. uh, Christopher did the battle of the ring. Uh, Rar, but actually we pitched it down so it actually sounds cooler. It sounds more like this. There are 9,000. 9,000 sound Nine, effects. 9,000 unique sound effects that go into the sound design uh, for Fable 2. In 90 meg? Yeah. That's outrageous. We fit it in 90 meg. unbelievable. We just finished the final mix. It's a, it's a Friday. No, it's, yeah, it's a Friday at... It is now Friday. Uh, yeah, it's Friday. At 12.05 uh, yeah, a.m. We just finished the final mix. We hope that everyone is going to enjoy it. In addition to the music and sound effects, recording of the dialogue is another important factor that needs to be taken into account. Right behind me you can see studio number one here at Side Studios in London, where we're just uh, right now at the moment recording uh, the Theresa character. Hello, young man. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist it, I'm sorry. <laughs> An unusual element in the average video game. Your appearance is beginning to change to reflect your actions. So long as your heart continues to beat, all that I require of you is obedience. Well, hello there. Always a nice surprise to have company. I don't get many visitors to my little coastal paradise. Especially ones who might well redefine a man's concept. Paradise. What's that? Nothing to worry about. Oh, yuck. Well, I hear that's lucky. Like finding a four-leaf clover. Why did you do that? I've never seen someone use will before. Oh, good one. Why did you do that? During the last days of development, only a few bugs are keeping the game from being finished. These are desperate and yet exciting times. We've got too many. We had 14 yesterday, 14 bugs. We came back in this morning and now we had 85. Six. Now we're on six, according six. to Jeremy. Might be 56, though. Six. <laughs> 51 bugs. Yesterday we got down to 14 and today we have 51. When all the bugs have been cleared, the game is considered to be finished. This is referred to in the industry as going gold. No, we have not yet. Sorry, sorry to be the bringer of bad news, but 
has been has a patch to the leaf. Nobody's had a chance to sleep in six months, George. We are writing personal thank you notes to all of the team um, and we're giving them a hamper to thank them for all the extra hard work that they have been doing for the last few months. I have to say, playing the complete games <laughs> is a great experience. I love it and the ending just made me cry. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> it made me weep. <laughs> How did I feel when Fable 2 went gold? It was kind of very anticlimactic because we were right in the middle of doing a live patch. You wanted to have closure. Yes, it's in the box, it's in the disc. But then on the other hand, we really want to get this out for day one. We really wanted to push for that. And it took so much effort, but I'm so pleased we managed it. And that was the point where I kind of felt, ah, yes, finally. Cool. Finally done, yes. Cool. And then we started working on downloadable content. <laughs> Never stops. Though. Never stops. <laughs> as soon as Swable went gold, we were on DLC. D DLC is something, you know, we, we want to do it for the people who like the game. We, we want to give more content. There were a lot of things we, we wanted to do in the original, but for whatever reason, you know, time or, or just because they didn't quite fit, um, we didn't get a chance to. So we've tried to sort of keep all those ideas on a list and then you know, make sure that we get to them in, in DLC. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to do stuff that you didn't get an opportunity to do in, in the original game. Not All Island is a place where the people from Not All Glade from Fable 1 went to for their various reasons. Not All Island is an island off the coast of Albion that sort of is separate from the mainland and existed in the first game as well. Not All Island is a, a magical island off the coast of Albion where Hera has to go and complete some quests to help the folk who are having a bit of trouble with their weather. If you've you know, completed most of the game, you can probably do the whole of Not Whole Island, but if you're only halfway through, you'll only be able to do up to certain points in the island. This island is ruled by magical totems that will change the seasons on the island. You get to Not Whole Island via submarine. Uh, Gordon, who's a, a resident of Not Whole Island, he, he's the one who's sent out to, you know, to find a hero um, and he comes to Bowerstone Market in, his, in a submarine he's built uh, and he's the one who takes you to Not Whole Island. There's going to be things on the island that you can't get anywhere else in Albion. There's a woman called Jessica who runs the mystery shop, the Box of Secrets, um, which is quite a unique shop. She's quite an interesting character. You'll get to know as you play Not Whole Island. She's got a face like a badger's, uh, badger's backside. I like her. <laughs> Why are you filming my um, blue? There's, there's lots to do. It's not just you know, a couple of outfits and a couple of swords. This is a proper downloadable content where you've got a proper existing level with lots to do and lots to see. You can only earn the achievements and only see the new content. Well, you can see the new content as a henchman, of course, but you can only kind of get the true experience of it if you have the premium yourself and only you earn the new achievements that we've added as well. There are weapons, there are potions, there are especially shops on the island uh, where you can do particular things which are unique to Nut Whole Island without giving too much away. You know, if you've got your character a bit fat then maybe they can uh, uh, take a potion and reduce that fatness. We've got armour, which was missing from Fable 2. We had in Fable 1, of course. And one of the nice things about the armour in Fable 2 is that it kind of, I'll just say that you might want to look at it when you're evil and look at it when you're good. And there's a really cool piece of armour which you can collect bit by bit in the dungeons, which will satisfy those needs for those people who like to wrap themselves in tin. And are there any surprises within the DLC? Yes, they are, but they wouldn't be surprises if I told you of that.
might not want to get capture that. Because <laughs> this is completely empty. We've been working on seeing the future. And I don't mean any psychic uh, seeing the future with the next DLC 2 pack. Basically, we got together and brainstormed and then we gave them ideas to the lead designers and they put that through a shredder and <laughs> we pieced together what was left. <laughs> we started with DLC 2 right after we finished Not Whole Island, so we didn't have quite a break there. <laughs> DLC 2, Seeing the Future, is, like its name states, uh, about the hero's future in Albion. So we've added story because we wanted to kind of gel things together. And that came from Peter, he kind of said that he wanted the story. Mergo's back and uh, he's got some few new interesting items for you. Unfortunately, all of them are as cursed as the music box, so uh, you end up being taken into various different worlds. The DLC intro. It's a bit of a spoiler, for sure. Yes, Teresa makes a comeback in her deals. Well, she never really left. She's always been around. So yeah, she's behind the scenes still. She's a very intriguing character. She comes across sometimes a bit dark, but then she's also very good. So that, that intrigue uh, certainly carries across to DLC too. You know, what is her purpose? What does she want from the hero? A very well-known character has something to show you. People can expect lots of weird and wacky things in DLC 2, uh, from uh, necromancers to crazy ghost hobs. Your dog, for instance, can now be transformed. Lots of people love the dog. Everyone loves the dog. He's fantastic. So we decided, what if people want to change their dog? So there's three new variants of the dog. People said, you know, I'd like a different dog. So yeah, have the Dalmatian there. Have the Husky. It's great. We had some ideas that we wanted to do and that we knew where we wanted to go with it, but um, we've tried to appease some of the more hardcore Fable players and make them happy because uh, they're special. For those that have played Fable 1, they will recognise, hopefully, Oakvale from that. It's nice to go back to Fable 1. For a lot of the team that have worked on it in the past, it's always like a trip down memory lane and it's nice to be able to bring that creativity back and hopefully people will recognise parts because Wraith Marsh from Fable 2 was Oakvale from Fable 1, but now you're able to see it as it was in between Fable 1 and Fable 2. Well, the new achievement, we wanted to use the full 250 points this time. There's a couple for like secret things and there's one for completing the core story, but we really wanted them to be, have a little bit of fun to them as well. So they're more like the Fable 2 retail ones than the DLC 1 achievements. The last thing you do on DLC 2, or the last thing you gain in DLC 2, is a key to a place where you can go and fight countless battles. The Colosseum is definitely one of the most challenging aspects of DLC 2. People said they wanted something just so challenging and, and difficult. They'd really have to take their time to be a high level hero. So the Colosseum is balanced around a high level hero and it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's still fun, but if you want to be the best in the Colosseum, if you want to get the ultimate prize, as it's called, uh, you have to be pretty good at it. The Necromancer, one of the particular quests, we wanted you to have a pretty epic fight with him. I mean, a lot of the boss characters in Fable 2, most players didn't really have much trouble with him. Uh, the Necromancer should give people a bit of a challenge.
land bursting with life, beauty and light. Its people unaware of the darkness that awaits them. Now they face their greatest threat, and they need their greatest hero, you. Unless someone better comes along. A champion who will make a stand. In a world where only the brave and the reckless venture far, while the rest hide cunningly in the bushes. And only the foolish don't pack emergency underpants. Battle fiendish evil and journey into its very heart. Live by your wits or rule by sheer strength. Be feared. Be worshipped. Be mocked. Be loved. Be a legend. Who will you become? Fable 2. Rated M for Mature. Will I find the light? Or be swallowed by darkness? I sense hope. Will I foresee harm? Will I know the blade? And taste the blood? I see the figure. I see its shadow. I see myself. Fable 2. Who will you become? Now 199.